What follows is a conversation I had with the three primary authors of a new paper called Equivariant Subgraph Aggregation Networks. And in this paper, they're exploring ways to overcome the natural limitations that GNNs have in expressive power. It's known that certain degenerate cases where two different graphs, when having message passing applied to them, can generate the same output, which means you can't distinguish among these two different graphs. Their method for solving this problem is to break a graph down into a collection of subgraphs via some policy like node deletion. And by doing message passing on this collection of subgraphs, you can actually distinguish between these cases that used to be degenerate and therefore overcome this limitation in expressive power because now you can tell the difference between these two graphs that you previously could not. That's the core of the idea here. But instead of stopping there, they also designed a GNN model architecture that leverages this idea. And in doing so, they analyzed the symmetry group of this collection of subgraphs objects and design a GNN architecture around that. Before going to the interview, let me mention that I just opened up enrollment for the second iteration of the Introduction to Graph Neural Networks online course. In it, we have two sections. The first is theory, in which we explore a lot of these ideas and try to get you up to speed quickly on notions of permutation symmetries and expressive power of GNNs, for example, to relate back to this interview. But we also have a hands-on section where you'll work with a cohort of fellow students through a set of exercises with guidance, videos, and screencasts, and so on. And that'll get your hands dirty so you're actually building GNNs. So if you're interested in this, a link will be in the description below. But act soon because enrollment is only open for a couple weeks, and then we're going to get started on April 1st. So I hope to see you there. Cool. Good morning. Thanks, everybody, for joining. I'm uh, really looking forward to this conversation. So if you want to just take a second, go around and introduce yourselves, uh, your name and, and of course, uh, your role in this paper and so on. Beatrice, you want to start? So hello, I'm Beatrice. I'm a PhD student at Purdue University. Uh, I work on graph neural networks and in particular on uh, uh, out of distribution extrapolation. And I'm one of the three first authors of uh, the paper. I mainly focus on the experimental part. Great. Fabrizio? Sure. Uh, I'm Fabrizio. So I'm a PhD student at Imperial College, London. I'm also a researcher at Twitter, uh, Twitter Cortex. Uh, I'm working on geometric deep learning and in particular graph neural networks and uh, Lately, I've been exploring uh, expressivity of these models and uh, something related to uh, substructures and mesoscale structures in general. Uh, yeah. uh, in the paper, I uh, focus mostly on uh, uh, describing, characterizing the expressive power of this architecture we, for, we uh, introduced, we proposed. Yeah. Great, thanks. Derek? Yeah, I'm Derek Lim. I'm a PhD student at MIT CSAIL. Um, I currently work on equivariant neural networks and graph neural networks, like a mix of theory and practice. Uh, I'm also a co-first author on this paper. There's three of us. And I worked on like characterizing how changing certain parts of our model like change the power of the model. Awesome. And Soji is helping me out today with the uh, interview. You want to introduce yourself, Soji? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Zach. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Soji. I'm, a, I'm an applied scientist at AWS, and I work on uh, graph representation learning, graph neural networks for uh, AWS products. Awesome. So let's dig in. Um, maybe we can motivate the problem a little bit, talking about the expressive power of message passing GNNs. Your sort of your paper is about overcoming the natural bottleneck. So, can you start by talking about the limits on the expressive power, how it relates to the one WL algorithm, and and so on? Um, maybe I can go. I could start on this. Maybe Fabrizio can add a bit too. Um, so, most of the widely used GNNs nowadays, they're almost synonymous with these so-called like message passing GNNs, as you mentioned, um, where each node 
takes information from each of its neighbors at every layer of the network. The problem is these have been found to be limited in expressivity, these message passing neural networks, meaning um, they cannot compute certain functions on graphs. They provably cannot. And they also cannot distinguish certain graphs. Like they will always map some different graphs to the same um, to the same outputs. And this is characterized in terms of this like older, like this, this algorithm that used to be studied in the past, this uh, Weisflower-Lehman algorithm for graph isomorphism. Um, so basically anything that the Weisflower-Lehman test can, cannot do, the GNNs, the message passing neural networks cannot do as well. And there have been like various graph neural networks that have been proposed to overcome this issue to like do better than this WL test. Um, but they also have various issues as well. Like for instance, um, many of them are really inefficient because instead of processing nodes, they have to process say like pairs of nodes or triples of nodes, which gives you like quadratic or cubic complexity. Um, and also they can require pre-processing or they may be very specific to a certain domain like molecules. Um, so Fabrizio, you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, as, as Derek was saying, so you can look at this through many angles. Uh, probably one of the most uh, interesting one is exactly the fact that uh, the, uh, the inability to distinguish uh, some non-isomorphic graphs relates to the inability to count some sort of structures on graphs. And yeah, I mean, uh, I think this is quite disappointing because uh, especially in some domains, you expect some Substructures like, for example, you know, triangles or rings to be very important. But then the fact that uh, you have your network and uh, this network cannot detect them and cannot even count them, uh, yeah, this might be a problem in in, in practice, right? So uh, I think uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, in the past years we've really tried uh, to uh, overcome this uh, limitations, basically. Um, it's a uh, it's an open uh, research problem, um, and uh, at the moment uh, many people are working on this, uh, and uh, there are some people also are trying to redefine uh, what the, like what's what's expressivity for GNNs. So uh, it's also to be mentioned that uh, this parallelism with the WL test might not necessarily be uh, in all cases the most convenient one to do, but. Uh, yeah, so it's just a really active area for, for research, so quite exciting at the moment. So the uh, high-level connection between these two things is uh, the 1WL algorithm is taking basically the colors or the, the labels on the neighbors and aggregating them into this multi-set or this collection of labels and then passing that through a hash function so that each collection is unique. And that's very similar to message passing GNNs because they collect the features of their neighbors and then aggregate them and pass through a neural network, which is essentially like a differentiable hash function. This connection has been made. So that's kind of the explicit connection between these two things. And, and as you mentioned, the, uh, if one WL can't do it, then a GNN definitely can't do it because it can only be worse um, because it's doing this aggregation step, at least is my understanding. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm about to show you one too. You want to go? And then the, uh, the blindness, for example, <clears throat> you mentioned close triangles. So um, one of the blind spots of 1WL is if a node is connected to two neighbors, whether or not those are connected to one another, it seems to not be able to distinguish, right? Because if you, and that's a very important um, structural property. So that seems exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's kind of especially if you think about, for example, link prediction, right? For example, so you may imagine that uh, the number of neighbors in common between two nodes this might be very important, right? Uh, uh, but then, like, um, so this is like a statistic that you may want to, to capture, for example. And if you think about it, this may be related to counting triangles on an edge between a uh, certain uh, pair of nodes. Uh, so this is a, you know yet another example of things you may want to be uh, um, you may want to be able to capture but yeah so the core idea you guys kind of propose and of course there's theoretical analysis and experiments and so on but the, the idea for how you're going to overcome this bottleneck of 1wl is that you're going to take 
a, a graph that you're working on and then generate a bunch of subgraphs from that by having some policy. And then you essentially have this bag of slightly modified versions of the base graph. Can you talk about how that's going to uh, overcome 1WL, like the high level idea that how does that process help you break some of these uh, blind spots of 1WL? So um, we have this like really nice example in our paper, for instance, in our figure one um, that goes over this. But intuitively, you could think about it like this. Like suppose you have, like Fabrizio said, like a triangle in the graph, just three nodes all connected to each other. And let's say you just call one of them node one. Then you don't know if like, you know, node one has neighbors two and three, but you don't know whether two and three are connected from the perspective of node one, right? But let's say you delete node one and then you look at the graph again. Then like node two, if, if node two and three were connected at the start, then they will still be connected. You'll have one edge in your remaining graph. If they were not connected at the start, then you, you'll just have like an isolated graph. So you'll have two isolated nodes, right? Um, and yeah, basically that's just one example, but this is like a, it's like a motivating example. Um, and later on we prove, we prove theory that shows like in, in many other examples, um, like wide classes of examples, this still kind of holds, it might be easier to process these subgraphs than graphs. And we process these subgraphs using message passing still, but it just, uh, another way to look at it is it breaks symmetries in the original graph that then message passing can handle. I see. So um, the thing that makes 1WL fail in some sense are these symmetries. And by breaking them down into a bunch of different pieces and then doing something like 1WL on the individuals and looking at that collection, then you can kind of, um, you can determine if two graphs are not the same because they'll break symmetries in different ways or something like that. Is that mm -hmm. kind of, okay. Yeah, um, precisely, yeah. So you need this what you call a policy to kind of take your base graph and generate this bag of subgraphs. We'll go deeper into this question of policies later, but can you just give a single example to kind of motivate the discussion for a moment? So Derek has mentioned this idea of removing, for example, a node, right? And uh, this is, uh, in fact, one of the you know, main um, strategies that we studied in the paper is quite simple and quite also intuitive, but it works very well in practice uh, to break the symmetries you were talking about. So the idea is you take a graph and, uh, you know, in a graph you have n nodes, uh, say, so you remove one node at a time, and this process will generate a bug of n, n subgraphs. And in each of these subgraphs, basically, um, you have that one node has been dropped along with the connectivity uh, related to that node. Um, so yeah, that is one policy, for example. So you can imagine slightly different um, variations of the same graph where you always remove like one node and then the associated connectivity. Um, and um, other examples could be you remove one edge at a time uh, and Derek will talk about this later probably, but we showed that this may be also even more powerful in some cases, for example, with respect to deleting just one node at a time. Uh, but you can also go, you know, more fun, like you can, uh, you know, figure out uh, more uh, interesting ways. For example, you can take this uh, ego net, so you can imagine um, the induced um, subgraph uh, on the EKO neighborhood uh, uh, you know, um, around one node, for example. So this will be like a local subgraph. You can imagine to do this for all possible nodes in the graph, and then you have a collection of these uh, econets, and then you can process them. And this also seems to work well, especially in practice. So um, yeah, there are many ways you can do that. And uh, the, the ones I've talked about, uh, uh, we show that uh, they are enough to go beyond one WL. Obviously, you can come up with policies which are not that interesting, and in that case, you might uh, lose exclusive power or not be able to go beyond one WL. But yeah, this is why we also did some kind of analysis on this. Soji, I think you had uh, questions about policies or something. Do you want to jump in here? Uh, yeah, actually. So I was wondering whether, you know, like for some of the, like I think you mentioned Fabrizio towards the end there, that like there are some um, maybe non-interesting policies that you could try. Could you give maybe an example of that? 
and maybe you know whether you tried some other policy. Yeah, I guess the same same question. So what kind of policies you tried that didn't really you know go past one WL? Um, in practice, we didn't really experiment with policies, and then we observed that they were failing. Uh, but uh, like the ones we really experimented on were these three, and they worked all very well. And some of them better than than others in practice. Uh, what I was imagining was like you can have, for example, degenerate policies. So if it, because in principle you can also imagine a policy which. Uh, generates a bag in which you have just one graph, which is the original graph. So in that case, the whole thing collapses to just a standard GNN, right? So it's a trivial example, but just to show that, uh, you know, this will start uh, um, uh, moving us into the mindset this is a, a framework which generalizes properly the standard um, uh, GNN uh, approach, right? So. Um, you can also think of generating um, some graphs in which you simply take one edge at a time. And um, in that case, if you're not careful about the specific architecture you use, then what you end up with is simply a set of edges. And therefore, you know, you may even uh, lose expressive power with respect to one of well, because what you see is simply a set of edges. So all the graphs with the same number of edges would be considered the same unless you do something more clever with the architecture um, to process them. But yeah, this is the, maybe one, one other example. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so actually that, that single edge policy that Rizzo was talking about, we, we kind of look at it in our, in our theory a bit. It's, it's actually, it's interesting for one aspect of our theory. Uh, but one more example that's like, you know, the single edge policy seems kind of foolish. You're only taking, you're only processing one edge at a time. Another example that's like, that's like uh, kind of surprisingly not that strong is taking all spanning trees of a graph as your policy, right? So a spanning tree is just any subtree that touches all the nodes, right? Um, you know, there's so many spanning trees of a graph. There's exponentially many compared to like you only have linearly many node deleted subgraphs, right? But we actually found this counterexample where spanning trees are really weak. Like even you can't even distinguish certain graphs that one WL or message passing neural networks can distinguish. And this was kind of counterintuitive, but it's it's very interesting because it's such a large policy, but it's 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 pretty weak spanning trees. Interesting. So once you have this policy, whichever one you're using, and you generate this bag of subgraphs, you're kind of representing them as a three-dimensional tensor by stacking the adjacency matrices along that third dimension. And then central to your work is kind of handling the various permutation symmetries of this object. So can you start by defining, first of all, what a permutation symmetry is in general, and then you can go into the permit, uh, the symmetry groups of this particular tensor object? Um, so just in general, these permutation symmetries, what they are. So imagine, say in the simplest case, you just have a set, right? Uh, you wanna represent a set of objects, meaning they're like the order does not matter, it's just a collection of objects. Uh, to process it in the computer, you have to represent it as a vector, right? You have like, if you have a set of N elements, you need to call, put something in index one, put something in index two and so on in this array. So then when you process that index, the, I mean that array, you don't want the order to matter, right? In your set. In other words, you want like the, the function applied to this array to be the same as the function applied to this array in any other order or any, in any permutation of that array. For graphs, there is also a very similar symmetry, a similar permutation symmetry where uh, you have a bunch of nodes in a graph and to represent on a computer, you need to give, you need to call one node like node one, another node, node two, and so on to put it in this matrix. And you want any function on this graph to not depend on which node you called node one, which node you called node two. So you want to be able to permute all the node names of the graph. Now, when we make this, this tensor, this 3D tensor you mentioned, um, what we're doing is we're taking a bunch of these graphs represented as matrices. And so that is one type of symmetry and we're stacking them to make a set of graphs. So that has another type of symmetry, the set symmetry, right? 
So now our, our total symmetries of this, um, this set of subgraphs, this bag of subgraphs, it's going to be, you could think about it as like the product of the set symmetry and the graph symmetry. So now we kind of have like two symmetries acting on this, this object. Um, and Fabrizio can tell you how we handle these. Before we so, get into that, let me try to, to summarize. You're saying that um, when you call this node node one and this other node node two, that you could apply a model to that and get an output. But then what you're trying to avoid is that if you swap the labeling and now two is one and one is two, you don't want your model to have a totally different output. You want it to basically give you the same thing because it's the same graph, just labeled differently. That's yes. kind of the idea, right? And, and now you're saying that when we're stacking these in a tensor, these adjacency matrices, we have another set of symmetries where it doesn't matter if we put it as subgraph one, two, three, or three, two, one, we have another symmetry we need to handle here. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's very well put. Exactly. Okay. So, mm -hmm. um, there are other cases of, of this sort of thing. Do you want to talk about, for example, convolution and translational equivariance, or you kind of mentioned, uh, deep sets or, or sorry, set permutation and variance, maybe the deep set model you can talk about, but to give some sort of motivating examples of other cases where we've seen this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so in images and computer vision, when we're processing just 2d images, right. Uh, we often think about approximate translation invariance, right. And what this means is if you have an image, where a cat is on like the top left corner of your image. And then you like shift this cat to be in the bottom right corner. You want your model to always say it's a cat. You don't want it to be confused at this, right? So something like a simple logistic regression on the images will not, you know, it will, it will care about where the cat is. Something like a simple multi-layer perceptron will care about where the cat is. But a convolutional neural network will, for the most part, not, not care as much about where the cat is. It will be able to detect it anywhere. Um, and yeah, that is, that is actually, it's, it's actually also a kind of permutation invariance because you can imagine like the, the indices that, that um, define where your pixels are at, you could kind of permute them and you want a very, you want a similar output for certain types of permutations, right? Um, and yeah, that's also a type of symmetry that arises. This might be a good time to talk about equivariant versus invariant to these symmetries. Can you define that real quick? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there I kind of simplified it. So um, I was just talking about invariances there because maybe it's a little easier to explain. But what an equivariance is, is you want your, your output is going to change when you translate your input, say. So let's say you, let's say we're in the image case. Um. So, and let's say we want to like generate a mask that kind of outlines where this cat is. So your output will be kind of like, looks like an image, but it'll have like a, it'll be like black pixels wherever the detects the cat to be. Then if you translate the cat, you're gonna, your output mask is also gonna translate the same way, right? You want your output mask to translate um, exactly how the cat translated. So that is equivariance, it's when you have an input, and then when you permute it, you want your output to permute in the same way, right? So that is also very important. And that's actually what convolutions, convolutions are doing, because when you apply this like this sliding filter, you're gonna, and then you apply a translation to your input, your output will translate the same. It's just that in convolutional neural networks, when we're doing say image classification, we have an invariant layer at the end like that pools all these, uh, you know, kind of like uh, all these feature pixels of, of the like uh, second to last layer, say, and this will generate an invariant and translation invariant output, which is say the, like the label cat. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> with equivariant, it's if you move the cat, then the output also moves. And mm -hmm. for translation invariant, that's if you move the cat, the output doesn't change at all but it would just say, yes, there's a cat there. So it mm -hmm. gives you like a yes or no, but not a where it's at. Is that a fair description? Yes, yes, exactly. I, I would say so, yeah. And this kind of moves to the uh, 
the model architecture you guys are proposing here, which you call H equivariant. So H is the, uh, the symmetry group of this tensor object that has both the uh, shuffling of the adjacency matrices and, and then the individual permutation symmetry of the um, individual adjacency matrices. So Fabrizio, maybe you can talk about um, the various blocks and strategy that you have for what you're stacking together in these H, H equivariant layers so that the whole thing is H equivariant. Right. So um, first of all, what, what is this H, right? So uh, Derek uh, was explaining that now we have like kind of two permutations and they are in a, uh, related via product. Uh, this is sim simply because we, may, we want to be equivalent or then invariant if we want in the end. But let's say for now equivalent to uh, not only the order of um, uh, the, the, the subgraphs in the back, but also to the order of the nodes in each subgraph, right? Now, we can actually think of this object, this bag of subgraphs in two different ways. Um, so the, the simplest way would be, well, you know, we simply have a bag and uh, each subgraph we consider it to be, it's just a graph and we don't really care about the what's the relation between these graphs right in the back. So in that case, uh, you can imagine each uh, subgraph in this spec. Uh, so the nodes for this subgraph can permute independently. Um, fair enough, right? So the, we simply um, have that we have a bag of this uh, subgraphs and um, it's fine. We uh, This is actually, um, um, modeled by a specific uh, product of symmetries, which is called the breadth product. But uh, in particular, one may also think, well, it's not like we are working with a bug of just independent subgraphs, like subgraphs came from the same original graph, right, in inputs via policy, right? So we can actually think of it uh, in a stricter sense. So, uh, I mean, the idea is that uh, each node in uh, in a um, in a sub, in a subgraph is actually um, uh, related to other nodes in other subgraphs, and in particular, we can consider these nodes to be aligned. That is because, for example, you know the node which was marked as say index uh, i by by index i, for example, in the original graph, then we could really track it through the bag, so through the subgraphs, and so we can actually say, well, this is this is what in the original uh, graph was not I, right? And we can do this on all subgraphs. So this leads us to this idea that um, permutations on the node indices uh, can also be enforced to be um, to act uh, in the same way on all subgraphs at the time. So you can imagine um, you want to uh, permute uh, nodes in a subgraphs. Well, since you have this alignment between nodes, then you can say, well, I will permute uh, the nodes on, in, of the other subgraphs in the same manner, right? Mm. Um, so, and this leads us to another um, CMH group, which is actually the direct product between these per permutation uh, groups. So, um, the, the thing is that this uh, direct product is actually a stricter um, a symmetry group. So this means that if you want to design an architecture that is equivalent to this group, this architecture in principle has less constraints on the way it is uh, designed, or let's say less constraints on the this way sharing pattern uh, you were mentioning, right? So in principle, this could lead us to more expressive power. And uh, this uh, this all intuition led, led us to design two different architectures. Um, one which is equivalent to this first symmetry group, so the breadth product in which the graphs may permute independently um, uh, from each other, and this other symmetry group, and, and one other architecture which is equivalent to the second symmetry group, the direct product, in which in this case we have we really leverage you know, this node alignment concept between um, you know across the graphs. And um, the architectures are similar, but there are some particular differences, some crucial differences. So if you want to be equivalent to the breadth product, so the first um, symmetry group, what we can do is we can uh, process each graph uh, with a permutation um, equivalent um, module. So for example, simply with a GNN. And 
each of these genets will have a uh, shared weight. So we can imagine this as a Siamese architecture when we apply the same GNN to all subgraphs independently. And we can keep doing this. And at some point, uh, we simply aggregate the representation. We, we pull the representation of each uh, subgraph and we aggregate it. And we have a representation for our own, our own um, uh, object we started with. Um, right. If you want to be equivalent uh, to um, uh, the, the direct product, uh, what we can do is we can design an architecture which we call DSS GNN, um, which um, is inspired by um, a blueprint um, that was originally um, introduced in another paper which appeared in, um, uh, I think it was 2020. Uh, so this uh, in this paper, uh, the authors showed really how to exactly how to design um, um, a layer which is equivalent to the direct products of uh, symmetries where the outer symmetry is a permutation, which is exactly our case. In our specific case, the inner product, sorry, the inner symmetry is also a permutation. But okay, this simply means that the internal modules of this layer will be GNNs, but the crucial difference with respect to the previous architecture is that we, not only we have the Siamese component processing like each subgraph with the same GNN, we also have a, a, a different GNN, so a GNN with different weights, which will process the aggregation of all the subgraphs. So uh, we have these mod modules in parallel, so we have a Siamese component, then we have another component with different weights processing the aggregation of the subgraphs, and then the idea is that we, in, in output from this last module, like the output of this last module will, will be fed back to the output of each of the Siamese uh, GNs. And then this will actually be the final output for our player. Uh, probably it's, uh, it's simpler uh, to, to take a look to, um, to, the, to the pictures we have in our papers, um, in our paper, but yeah. This yeah. So if I can... Try to summarize, and please correct anything I get wrong. But uh, if, if we think about this three-dimensional tensor object, so if we look at a single channel of that, which is like a, a single adjacency matrix, you have the permutation symmetry that you would of any graph. And the way you kind of handle that is you use a GNN, because those naturally kind of handle the permutation symmetry of the nodes. And then you also have this uh, symmetry of the subgraphs themselves in this third dimension of the tensor. And the way you handle that symmetry is that you uh, apply the same GNN to each of those um, subgraphs. So that's kind of this weight sharing scheme where you'll be equivariant to any shuffling there because your outputs will be reflected by a shuffling of GNN outputs. And then finally, you do this invariant kind of information sharing between the subgraphs by aggregating across that kind of third dimension and then applying a GNN on top of that. Does that kind of yes. capture it? Okay, so that's kind of the... And, uh, but crucially, the second GNN is not uh, the same we, we used before. It must be another oh. GNN. Got it. And then... And uh, this, uh, this idea of, you know, uh, aggregating through the third dimension, the, you know, the, the, the Z axis, let's say, of the sensor is what we informally call this needle operation because we can imagine we pass a needle through uh, the nodes of the subgraphs because they are aligned, we can do this, right? Um, yeah. And we connect so, their features this way, basically. So I have a question here, but like, I think first of, um, Fabrizio, did you say that like being equivariant to the red product was more expressive than the direct product or vice versa? So it's uh, vice versa. So the, the direct product um, is stricter as a symmetry uh, group. So we have less constraints on the architecture. So in principle, by being equivalent to um, the direct product, we, we can aim to um, have more expressive architecture. Yes. Right. And, and then, um, so on this um, information sharing module, like, um, like for the stricter direct um, product. So in the paper, um, it seems like you're aggregating all of the um, features and all of the subgraphs in the bag of subgraphs. Um, then there's a line that says, well, like the aggregation for the subgraphs is the max 
Wait, so you're using the original graph as the aggregation of the subgraph, is that correct? Um, you could do that. Uh, you can also, for example, just sum the adjacencies. Uh, obviously, you know, if you do the max, it also depends on the policy, right? But uh, what I wanted to say, I guess, is that um, if you have a policy such that um, each edge appears in at least once a graph, and then you do max aggregation, for example, then you will recover the original connectivity of the input graph, right? So this is something which is already interesting because if you imagine you simply process each subgraph independently without this segregation information, uh, you know, information uh, sharing module, for example, in that case, you don't really have visibility on the original connectivity anymore, right? Whereas unless you artificially inject back, you know, the original graph is one of the other graphs in the back, but, you know, from a um, theoretical standpoint, uh, you kind of lose this uh, visibility on what was the original uh, connectivity. Whereas if you perform this aggregation, and if you use a policy such that each edge appears in at least once a graph, then you can recover back the connectivity in the original graph as well. I see. So um, maybe if I can summarize, what you're saying is that like in your framework, you can, you know, um, do like, you know, whatever allowable aggregations, right? But then there's this interesting case where if your policy is generating, like, um, you know, uh, if your policy allows you to generate subgraphs, where if you max them over, you can, like, you know, recreate the original graph. And like, this is a sort of neat thing that comes out, right? But this is also how you're doing this practically in the, like for the experiments. Yeah, yes, uh, exactly. I wanted to dig into the theoretical analysis piece. Uh, Soji, was there anything you wanted to to add or ask about about the DSS? First of all, what does DSS stand for? Just to help my brain remember it. Yeah, so um, DSS stands for uh, deep sets for symmetric elements. Okay. Um, so deep sets is was this like permutation invariant neural network architecture that came out like maybe four or so years ago. Um, and then this 2020 paper um, by Agai Marone and his co-authors, which is the, he, he was the last author of this paper, the senior author of our paper. Um, in 2020, he came up with this deep sets for symmetric elements where not only do you have a set, you have a set where each element of that set has its own symmetries, you know? So this is actually exactly what, what we have in some sense. We have a set of subgraphs and each subgraph has its own symmetries, right? These permutation symmetries. And, and by the way, um, this DSS uh, perspective that we take, we get it, uh, we can use it because like we, we kind of properly analyze the symmetries of these bags of subgraphs. So, so actually other works have, there's been other somewhat similar works that are like much less general than ours in the, the last like year or year and a half. Um, and what they do is they, they typically all usually just use this DS, this deep sets framework. They don't realize like the deep, the DSS symmetry. In other words, they have this, they realize this wreath product symmetry. So they process each subgraph independently, but they don't realize this, direct product symmetry, this DSS symmetry. So they, they, they don't really like deal with the aggregation of all subgraphs at a time. So this is a one very large um, contribution of our work. So that's a distinction you make where the, the DSS architecture does this kind of information sharing between the subgraphs, but then the DS GNN that you present essentially just disables that component of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So on the theoretical analysis, um, the one WL, as we kind of briefly touched on before, is going to take information from the one hop neighborhood of each node and map the uh, multiset or the collection of labels through some uh, hash function. And then you're extending that essentially with this DSSWL. So can you talk about how it's different from one WL and how it operates on this bag of uh, symmetric objects? 
Yes, so uh, the idea was to try to have some, um, we wanted to have, you know, some some tools to characterize the expressive power of the, our architecture uh, in terms of distinguishing uh, anonymous graphs. Um, so we, we decided to take this little detour uh, and uh, we decided to um, design a, co a combinatorial uh, counterpart of this DSS GNN architecture. And so we said, okay, let's, uh, let's try to analyze it. And what uh, came out uh, was that we could basically redefine a new um, color refinement algorithm, uh, which uh, is a generalization of WL. Now, uh, the difference is that, so first of all, WL just runs in the original graph, right? So you have a graph and simply you, you run this color refinement algorithm, you, uh, a heuristic, let's say, uh, color refinement rule um, you, uh, you, you mentioned. So in TSS WL, we follow the same idea um, that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the one behind our architecture. So we apply a policy, we generate a bug of subgraphs, and then we run call refinement on each of the subgraphs. Um, the way we do it is we apply a similar uh, call refinement step on each node of each subgraph, but the difference being that we have additional inputs in the call refinement rule. So not only we hash injectively, hash the um, current color of a node and the mod set of colors for neighbors, we also hash um, this along with two additional inputs. So we have one, which is what we were calling, you know, um, this uh, needle uh, color, let's say. So we uh, compute the math set of colors for the same node, but across the bag, since we have this alignment. So we wanted to leverage that. So this input uh, is what we use to actually perform this, um, um, to capture uh, this alignment. So again, the third input is this uh, math set of node colors for the same node, but cross subgraphs. And then the last input is um, basically um, um, it's similar to the um, to the second, but it's on actually because it's uh, it gathers colors from neighbors. But the, the so the the idea is that we gather uh, this needle colors from the neighbors of this node, right? And we do this on the original connectivity. And if you think about it, basically, this is kind of, um, this resembles what we do in our DSS GNN uh, neural architecture, because we aggregate, so we can imagine, as we, we were saying before, we can imagine to aggregate the connectivity of each of graphs, and this will, um, for the policies at least we study, this will recover the original connectivity. And then on this original connectivity, we apply a different GNN. Uh, and the inputs to this uh, different GNN will be uh, the aggregation of node features across the graphs. And this is basically what we're doing here, right? So we are computing this multi set of node colors, but across the graphs. And then we are aggregating them uh, through the neighborhood based on the original connectivity. So we have this additional uh, two inputs. And the idea is we keep applying this uh, core refinement rule, which is an augmented core refinement rule with respect to the standard WL uh, algorithm. But we do this on each subgraph independently. And then at each step, we could imagine to um, um, uh, injectively, um, let's say, pull the colors we have on each um, subgraph to generate an histogram of subgraph colors. And this is what we use to um, compare to uh, input graphs. So we compare uh, the um, histogram of subgraph colors. And if they differ, then we say, OK, then the two input graphs are isomorphic. Um, this is the, the idea. And to, um, again, um, uh, if we use a policy uh, like a, um, uh, a trivial policy, which is I simply generate one subgraph, which is the original graph, and we disable the two uh, additional inputs, we could recover the standard WL test, basically. If we, um, if we use a non-trivial policy, so we actually generate a bag, um, a non-trivial bag, uh, but still, if we disable the, the, the additional inputs, what we have is actually a new uh, variant, which is what we call the SWL, 
which is the counterpart of the second architecture. So the one where we don't have this information sharing component. And what happens is that we simply run this WL on each subgraph independently. So there's never yeah, information sharing. And this is, you know, uh, akin to running the same as GNN on each of the subgraphs as we were saying before. And so we have these two variants. Uh, obviously, the first one is the most general one. And by disabling some components, we can recover this um, DSWL variant, which is the counterpart of the DSGNN architecture. And by using a trivial policy, we can recover the standard WL algorithm. This is the um, a hierarchy of um, these new variants. And um, after doing this, uh, this gave us some, um, basically, we, we, we kind of moved to the space of combinatorial algorithms, uh, core refinement algorithms, and um, in this space, we managed to, um, to prove some results that then we used to show that um, our architecture is actually uh, strictly more expressive than standard GNNs for some policies. Right, so in theorem one, you you basically show that uh, assuming you have the right subgraph generation policy that DSSWL can distinguish everything that one WL can plus some kind of edge cases. You show the uh, circulant skip link graphs that one WL fails on those, but DSSWL um, succeeds on all of those with different parameters. So it's strictly more powerful. That's kind of the, the essence of theorem one, if I understand it. Yes, yes. And this is typically what you do when you want to show this kind of results. So first of all, you need to show that uh, the, your algorithm can like uh, distinguishes all the pairs that are distinguished by the other algorithm. And then you need to find some counterexamples, which are distinguished by your algorithm, but not by the other one. This allows you to actually say, to, you know, to, uh, to say that you're strictly more powerful. Um, yes. And, and then the... Uh... Theorem 2 basically says that the model architecture you came up with can basically distinguish what DS, uh, DSSWL can. And then, of course, DSSWL is the upper bound of what can be distinguished by this architecture. Yes. Yeah, so as I was saying, it, it was a little detour. Then we had to kind of, kind of come back to where it started from, right? So then in order to close this, uh, this loop, we, we showed that uh, our architecture can actually implement, or in other words, can simulate what this combinatorial algorithm is doing. And so if it can, then it means that uh, in principle, we can achieve the same uh, expressive power. And this expressive power is uh, what we like because it's strictly more expressive than um, standard WL test. And the corollary of this is that it's strictly more expressive than standard message passing neural network. Now, are there any plans to try to theoretically analyze the um, policies to understand the properties of policies that sort of will give you the expressive power you want and uh, rule out some of the more interesting ones like like Derek mentioned with the uh, um, spanning trees? Uh, yeah, I think Derek can uh, talk about this more in details, but um, I, I so we have to specify that it, it's not for all possible policies that you are uh, strictly more expressive because as I was saying, there may be simply like trivial policies which would, wouldn't allow you to. Uh, but for the very intuitive and reasonable ones we studied in the paper, this holds. So for example, this ego net policy, this node deletion, edge deletion, all of them like uh, work fine to be, and they're okay if you want to be more expressive than standard, uh, the standard uh, MPNNs. Uh, Derek, you want to maybe add something about this? Yeah, so I'd say, like, maybe philosophically, the space of policies is just massive, right? Like, the space of policies is, like, every point in this space is, like, you for every graph, you could get some type of subgraphs from it. Um, so I don't know if there's anything that nice and unified, we could say. But we, we do analyze uh, several specific policies, at least. Like the policies we do experimentally, we analyze them at least. Cool. So speaking of experiments, um, Beatrice, can you help us dive into this? So the first set are around these synthetic data sets that are kind of designed to break uh, the 1WL. Can you introduce uh, the data sets and, and uh, the experiments that were done on them? 
Yes. So in that sense, we consider it like two uh, families of uh, of data sets, like the RNI data sets and the CSL data set. And uh, those are, as you said, are designed uh, to be like non isomorphic, like to contain non isomorphic graphs that are uh, one WL equivalent. So, in the in using those data set, you can actually see if, uh, like, practically you can you can perform better than one WL test. So the RNI data sets contain uh, uh, data set are like those are two data sets and contain uh, graphs that represent uh, uh, propositional formulas where the target is uh, whether the formula is satisfiable or not. And uh, there are pairs of graphs that are non-isomorphic, 1WL indistinguishable, but that represent uh, uh, two different formulas where only one of them is satisfiable. So the target is different for these pairs of subgraphs that are 1WL indistinguishable. And we showed that uh, we could obtain perfect accuracy. So we were able to distinguish uh, those uh, those graphs while uh, standard uh, message passing neural networks cannot not do better than one WL test. Like cannot do better than, than random guess on this on this data set. So we also did uh, like this experiment considering the CSL data set, uh, which uh, again con contains uh, uh, one WL equivalent subgraph, and we again obtain perfect perfect accuracy. So this kind of demonstrates that um, it, that your method can overcome this bottleneck essentially. Yeah, exactly. Like we wanted to validate what we theoretically showed and like see if we could in practice uh, actually uh, have, have this. And then next you kind of moved on to these more realistic data sets that weren't you know designed for this specific question, but just to see if there's lift added above methods that already have shown some success. So you have the TU data sets and OGB. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the data sets and the experiments? Yes. So, yeah, we obviously also wanted to see if in practice we gained uh, some 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 performance and uh, we considered like a variety of data sets. They are also on the experiment we considered more. Uh, so we considered the TU data sets, which are like yeah, standard baselines and uh, uh, yeah, as you said, OGB, Zinc. Uh, in like those are uh, I think like collections that are used uh, in practice. We showed that we could do better than the base encoder at least generally because like we we obviously wanted like our goal was to see if we could out outperform what uh, was the the base architecture that we built upon, and uh, so this is like what we showed. Yes. We were better than base encoders. We also wanted to see how DSS performed compared to, to DS, like DSS GNN compared to DS GNN. And we saw that uh, DSS GNN was uh, better than the base encoder, I think like 91% of the time, while DS GNN was better than the base encoder 75% of the time. So showcasing that also in practice on those data sets that maybe like are not do not contain uh, uh, those one uh, WL equivalent subgraphs, we can achieve a gain in performances. So a question here is the base encoder refers to the GNN that you use in the Siamese GNN? Exactly, like the GNNs that like the GNN architecture that we use either in the Siamese, but also like in the second GNN, the ones that consider the aggregation of the subgraphs. Right. So there are identical uh, architectures, but like different parameters. Yes, different weights. Yeah. So the um, it, it mentioned it takes around two x or three x the time by doing this kind of bag of subgraphs thing, and you've restricted the experiments to graph classification task. And uh, there's a footnote saying it's kind of easy to um, change the readout layer so that this could be node classification or something like that. And I'm wondering um, about this scalability thing, because as you mentioned, the uh, with the node deletion policy, the number of um, back or subgraphs you can get is basically the number of nodes you have, which can be billions. And obviously that's not going to be practical. So how do you guys, you have like a stochastic version of this. So can you first talk about that and then also 
talk about how you could modify the readout function to use other tasks rather than just graph classification? Yes. So the stochastic version was to see like to to see if in practice uh, we could maintain this gain in performance, but uh, like practically um, deleting some subgraphs uh, from the bag and uh, like so see if we could perform well. We considered like several fractions of, uh, of subgraphs. Uh, like fraction of the original. So instead of considering 100% of the bag, we consider like 5% of the bag, uh, 50, 20 and 50% of the bag. And uh, we obtained like this fraction just by uniformly sampling uh, uh, at random at every, every epoch. And uh, we showed that uh, there was like that in practice, stochastic uh, variants were able to perform equally well, even when considering only 5% of the subgraphs, which is a huge reduction of the number of subgraphs that you consider. And also that sometimes we were able even to outperform, like that this added randomness uh, helped it in practice uh, to outperform mm -hmm. the original 100% uh, approach, like 100% subgraphs approach, the full bag. So yes, we have like experiments on these uh, stochastic variants and like variants, like uh, these sampling variants are important because you can, for example, consider that like if you reduce the number of subgraphs that you consider for each graph, then in practice you can run on bigger graphs uh, where maybe considering the full bag is impractical because you would have a lot of subgraphs or also maybe can speed up existing uh, like ex what you already have on on the on the that like the data set that you already have because maybe now you can consider a larger batch like simply for yeah the changes i think you asked uh, for changes to consider node classification i think like if you simply don't do a readout function on the subgraphs, but you keep considering the, like, so you, you don't aggregate uh, the, the nodes uh, in each subgraphs uh, into a representation of the graph, but you maintain the representation of each node separately and you aggregate instead only over the subgraphs. So then you have you still have a representation for each node that you can use uh, to to predict any property of the node, so to perform a node classification instead of uh, instead of graph classification. So you just apply like a deep sets model across the dimension yes. of the uh, the third dimension of this tensor, something like that. Yes. Did you guys do any experiment? I know it's not in the paper, but did you try that at all? Oh, we didn't. Uh, just because, like, we we focused on graph classification and left it for future work. And inference in this case. So that means uh, I assume you apply the policy as sort of a one-time thing. And then during inference for the holdout set, you basically use that bag in, in totality, right? Am I missing uh, something there? For, what, do you mean for the stochastic variant or in general? In general, you, you have to, I assume, generate this up front as like a pre-processing step and then just maintain that uh, data structure? Yes, yes, exactly. And a question here, I, I wonder how much of the performance gain results in something like bagging, like random forest, for example. You know, you're, you're taking uh, random samples of your data and fitting this kind of weak learner to it and then aggregating the results and that sort of gives a robustness to the model and, and you know prevents overfitting. I wonder how much of the benefit is coming from something like that, where it's kind of like a, a form of dropout or augmentation, where you're getting um, your model to be robust to these perturbations in the graph, and that may help it generalize, as opposed to being limited by expressive power. Do you have any thoughts of how to? Um, dig into that? Like, is there an experimental way that you could look at that, an ablation study or something, or any impressions? Yeah, it's a great question, I think. Um, 
it's uh, so this idea of uh, you know maybe this kind of model models are uh, you know learning how to, to be robust to these perturbations has been explored to some extent uh, yeah um, not really thoroughly but at least it was introduced in another paper which uh, was uh, concurrent to ours and it's very similar they don't as, as Derek was saying they don't study the whole set of symmetries uh, but there's still this concept of you know removing nodes and working on this uh, they call it deck uh, of, of the grass so and they actually mentioned this and they hypothesized that this uh, is actually the case that the model is kind of um, learning how to, to be robust to these perturbations. Um, and this is a good point because uh, this is something that I guess we still have to uh, work on a lot in terms of, you know, our, you know, the community, uh, this uh, understanding more this relation between expressive power and generalization, right? Because we've mentioned a lot that, yeah, we were able to increase uh, the expressive power of the, of the model, but then what we do is it's not like we, we look at the training side right? at the training uh, loss right we look at the test loss hmm. and therefore the model needs to generalize to get uh, good test loss um so yeah i mean uh, there's still a lot to do in that sense uh, obviously you know uh the important is that uh, if you have more expressive power then uh you don't uh, uh fear underfitting right so this should help in principle but um, we haven't really, uh, I think in general as a community, we haven't really studied this sort of thing, like this relation between the two when we, when it comes to this kind of uh, graph, graph, classi graph, classi sorry, graph classification tasks. Um, in any case, uh, there's some evidence, if you look also at uh, leaderboards uh, for this kind of, uh, for example, molecular uh, modeling tasks, there's some evidence that more express expressive approaches tend to work better than less expressive approaches. So it seems like, yeah, there's some evidence that uh, having more expressive power also helps you um, in terms of, you know, generally the, the, the test uh, performance. Uh, but again, like, uh, it's, there's still a lot to understand in this, uh, I think. And yeah. to sum up, I think probably in our work is a mixture of the two, I guess. Um, this is my, my hypothesis, but yeah, so, sorry, Derek. Mm, oh, yeah, yeah. I was just going to add, like, back to this bagging thing and this robustness. Uh, there's, there's two connections I want to make. One is when people study robustness of graph models, they often do things that look like our policies, as in they will, like, say, they'll delete some edges and they'll be like, oh, Maybe our graph model is robust or non-robust to this. For instance, in real data, this could be like in a road network, just like destroying some roads and seeing whether your transportation still works, right? Um, that's in the study of robustness. Two is the study of data augmentation and say self-supervised learning for GNNs. The data augmentations that people use kind of look like our policies. Like they will delete some nodes, they will delete some edges, and, and so on. And I think there's a lot of connections to be made there. Great. Thank you. Um, Soji, you had a question, I think, about... Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a maybe like implementation question on the on how you sort of construct mini batches in this like tensor like, um, like formalism that you have, right? Like, so um, my understanding um, is like for graph classification tasks, in order to like parallelize the computation, you sort of, you can batch up the graph, like like different graph instances into one giant graph. And then that way you can like, you know, fit stuff on. Is, does your method allow you to do something similar? Cause you already have the tensor um, representation where you're kind of batching like the bag of subgraphs and that's still just one data point for you, right? But then can you then batch different bags of subgraphs? That's exactly what we do. Yeah, then you have, uh like you consider it's like you consider a large subgraph where you have disconnected components that each represent a graph and actually inside you still have disconnected components that are the subgraphs you just need to keep the indices that you need for the aggregations right so uh, yeah that's, that was going to be my follow-up question is like so you keep track of the like yeah. node indices across each of the different subgraphs 
yes, you keep track yeah, yeah, of which node belongs to which subgraph and to which original graph. And then when you need to aggregate, you like you need to consider only the nodes in a certain graph. Like so, yeah, like so for the GNN, only you consider the connectivity, for example, within the subgraph for the first part, the CMEs part. Then uh, once you, I don't know, like once you have to aggregate to obtain a representation of the graph, you need to consider all the nodes in all the subgraphs uh, in the graph. Right. And then for the um, information sharing one, you still also need to consider the indices across the different subgraphs. Yes, yes, exactly. And you you can uh, like you can maintain the original uh, adjacency matrix, so the original connectivity to speed. Oh, right. Yeah. So the empirical results, if you look at the OGB, for example, it's not that um, huge of an improvement over simply just using GCN. And I'm wondering how much of this do you think is a result of maybe not needing additional expressive power for the particular data set here versus, you know, there's these other challenges to just training GNN, just practical challenges like the over um, squashing problem and over smoothing problems and so on that, Usually, uh, you know, for example, in other domains of deep learning, they've had like batch normalization that have come out and made huge changes in the performance we can get, not because of some theoretical advancement necessarily, but because of just helping the convergence of the models and so on. So I'm wondering, do you think to unlock kind of that next set of performance, is it that we just need tasks that are uh, needing more expressive power? Or do you think there's these other kind of training tricks we need to figure out that will unleash the expressive power we already have? So uh, first of all, yeah, this happens for the GCN in the deep set GNN on the OGP datasets. And we left it because I think it's an interesting, uh, like we thought it was an interesting result, but we like this requires additional uh, like investigation on why this happens. But generally speaking, it has been empirically shown that, uh, for example, GCN and GIN are overparameterized on these uh, data sets. So changing the base encoder might actually might actually help. It's something we left uh, for like for future work. While for there are other data sets where we proved uh, uh, to to be empirically way more like way more performant than other methods. Like on Zinc, we proved uh, our method to be like the best performing model uh, amongst all the domain agnostic uh, uh, models on, on this particular data set while still having the same parameter budgets that that it's required for the data set. So yeah, like maybe un to unlock the performance, it's just needed to change the, the base encoder. It's something we left for future work. Excellent. Yeah. Can I maybe comment on the uh, what you say about things like batch norm? So um, just in terms of GNN theory, wh what has happened is that people have studied function approximation properties and expressivity properties in GNNs more than like anything else. And like this is because, so in, in general neural networks, right? Like multilayer perceptrons, people proved they were universal like decades ago. But GNNs, they're, they're not universal. They can't learn any function you care about, right? They're bounded by this one WL. So people have studied this function approximation. Um, but the, the field, I mean, you know, there, in, in, other, uh, in other like fields of machine learning, people study other things in theory, like generalization and optimization, which has not been touched as much in GNNs. And I think, I think those are very important because that's, uh, assuming you can get like decent results in that, that, that tells you like how you learn, not just like what you can learn, which is what function approximation is about. Yeah. And I'm wondering, <laughs> practically speaking, one WL, how big of a limitation do you think that is really in like our realistic task? So, so for testing graph isomorphism, the, the data sets we care about, they like none of the graphs are like one WL indistinguishable, but Nice. Like basically for graph isomorphism, 1WL is just fine for the data sets we care about. But the limitations of 1WL are not just limited to the graph isomorphism. 1WL also can't count triangles or any cycles or even like very other simple substructures. I think that will be much more important. 
um, than testing graph isomorphism in our data sets. For instance, counting cycles might be very important for molecular tasks, right? And people have shown that, like, I mean, Fabrizio's, some of Fabrizio's work has shown that, like, adding cycles into your GNN will improve your GNN a lot on molecular tasks. So that's why I think WL is limited. Oji, any final uh, questions or? Uh, no. Um, thanks for your time, guys. Uh, this is very informative. Yeah, it's really exciting work. You, you guys have anything you want to conclude or sign off on? Uh, I think it's been a great session. So thanks a lot for arranging this. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. Yeah, awesome. thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thanks for taking the time. We'll be in touch. Hope to see you again soon.